Well, it's a very pleasure of mine to introduce Professor Jörg Brendel, a very well-known mathematician in the area of set theory, uh, one of the greatest specialists in cardinal invariance of the continuum. Uh, myself, 25 years ago, I was a PhD student. I was already reading Jörg's paper, so it's, it's very nice we, we have met in, in some conference worldwide, so here's now he with us at Salvador Bahia, and we'll talk about his area of expertise, cardinal invariance of the continuum. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, so my talk will be, it's sort of an introductory talk about cardinal invariance of the continuum, so what I will do at the beginning, I will give some motivation, I will give some uh, Examples, I will present some proofs, some basic proofs, which can be understood by, I mean, which should be understandable for everybody. And then I will move on and uh, discuss some more difficult results and will end basically with very recent research. That's the idea. Now, uh, during the talk, if you have any questions, just interrupt me. Please uh, ask, feel free to ask uh, at any time. Okay, so, uh, I don't see, so this headline, no, but the headline is not important, so I think you can't see it very well. Right. So, uh, this first slide is just a very general slide about card invariants, so what card invariants are about. Let me just say C, uh, the letter C stands for the size of the real numbers, of the set of real numbers, of the set R which of course is the same size as the counter space to the omega or the pair space of the to the omega. So that's the size of the continuum. Now what are called the events of the continuum? These are cardinal numbers whose size is in between the first uncountable cardinal RF1 and C, the size of the continuum. So uh, they are uncountable but less or equal than C and they characterize the structure of the set R of all the numbers, or actually of the counter space or the bare space. Uh, I will come back to the counter space and the bare space. Of course, all of you know the real numbers. Now, in set theory, usually when we talk about real numbers, we rather use uh, 2 to the omega, the counter space, or we use omega to the omega, the bare space. Because from the set theory point of view, they are, more, they are uh, easier to handle. So they are much better for our purpose. But, they are just another representation of the real numbers. So the real numbers are of less different But I will come back. And uh, uh, of course, what we are talking about here, we talk about cardinals which are between RF1 and C. Now if CH holds, if the continuum hypothesis holds, that's just a statement that uh, the size of the real numbers is the smallest possible, which is RF1. So it's either one, then of course all of this is trivial because then all count invariants, because I said they are between R1 and C, then they will be equal to R1 and C, so that's not interesting. But if CH fails, then the continuum may be much larger, maybe R2, but it also may be whatever, it may be much, much bigger, it may be even accessible, whatever. And then, uh, the, then of course these invariants become more interesting because they then may take values some way between R1 and R2. And the same invariant may take different values in different models of CFC. So one invariant, a given invariant, in some models it can be RF1, but the continuum is large. In other models, but still the continuum is large, it can be equal to the continuum. So there are many <coughs> different models of CFC here. And now, if we have several card invariants, then a very interesting question is, or a very interesting problem is to compare them. So say we have invariants x and y, we want to find out whether there's a relationship between them. Is x less or equal than y? I mean, one card is less or equal than the other. And of course, either this must hold, or it must consistently fail. So whenever you have two invariants, there are two options. Either x less or equal than y holds in ZFC, and ZFC is the standard x system of safety here. Or uh, you have that x bigger, strictly bigger than y is consistent. And of course, to find out which order it holds, 
Sometimes it is very easy, it's almost trivial, and sometimes it's a deep problem. And there are even there are many problems of this kind which I which I actually mentioned. There are still many other problems. And then of course when we are looking for the second alternative, namely the consistency result, then we use forcing, so that's the uh, method for showing consistency results of this type. And typically, the most typical pattern, which is the one which is best known, is that if you have two common variants, you want to show the consistency of x2 to be bigger than y, then you force that y is equal to r of 1, and at the same time x is equal to r of 2, which is then also equal to this is sort of the easiest pattern, and that's the pattern which is best understood. At the end of my talk, I will come to a situation where this pattern actually fails. I mean, when, when the computer is much larger. And then there are, there are many more open problems, and then it gets, in a sense, it gets even more interesting. Now, why do we study current invariants? Of course, there are many reasons. I mean, they are, first of all, they describe a set of real numbers, and the real numbers are very important and basic for mathematics, so this is, this is one motivation. But another motivation is that they also play an uh, important role in the applications of safety in other areas of mathematics. I mean, in particular in general topology, but also in group theory, in real analysis, in functional analysis. I mean, there are many, many areas they have been used and are still being used. I will not talk about application. I will give sort of an introductory talk about covariance and also about the sort of about the theory, about the basics, and about the uh, problems we, we are thinking about nowadays, but uh, not about applications. Okay, so the first two examples are B and B. They are called the unbounding and the dominating number. Let's first introduce a partial order on, fu on function in the bare space. So we have, we look now at omega to the omega. So this is the set of all functions from omega to omega, from the natural numbers to the natural numbers. And we say that a function f is eventually dominated by g, and that's abbreviated by this symbol here, let's say for star. It means that, well, in a sense what the word says, that the set of exception points, the set of points where uh, g is not above f, is finite. So there's only a finite number of points n, such as f is bigger, strictly bigger than g n, and otherwise f is so the pictures like this, we have, we have omega and omega, and we have a function f, and then the function g eventually dominates that it means for a while g may be below f, but eventually from some point onwards g will always be below. So that's the picture here. And so we look at this ordering, and we look at two cardinals related to this ordering. One is the unbounding one, but the other is the dominant one. So the unbounding number is the smaller size of an unbounded family in the sense of this ordering. So it's the smaller size of a set of functions in omega to the omega, such that uh, there is no function which bounds all of these functions. So for every function g, there is a function in, in the family such that this function is not bound, is not dimensional bound, not dimensional dominant. And the other one is the dominating number. That's the smaller size of a cofinal set. This is all actually so a dominating set. It means the smaller size of a family such as for every g in omega to the omega there's an f in the family such that g is lesser than f. This or let's say it was started as the eventual dominant form. Okay, so now let's see. What can we say about these cardinals? Very, very basic and very easy result is, I mean, they are called invariants in our sense, so they are between RF1 and C. They describe the structure of the continuum, and, uh, and well, we have this relation. And that's uh, sort of, so let me quickly give the proof. First, we have RF1 is less or equal than B, so this just says that B is uncountable, that's a diagonal argument. So how do you prove this? Suppose we have countably many functions f n and in omega. So this is a countable family of functions from omega to omega. And this can be eventually dominated. This is just sort of doing the diagonal and we define f of k. This is the max of f n of k where n is less than k. 
So for each k, there are only finitely many functions for which we have limits, so that's fine. So this definition makes sense. And it's clear that, of course, every fn, I mean, as soon as k gets bigger than n, the function f will be like So this function will be one of these functions in the event. Okay, so this shows that b must be uncountable. Now the next thing is b less or equal than b, that's obvious. I mean, I leave this to you to I mean, think about it. If you have a dominating family, then it's also good. Because every, every weakness for d is a weakness for d. And finally, the last one is also trivial because, uh, of course, the set, the whole set, I mean, omega to the omega test has unseen. And here, here we look for a subplane, we look for a small size of the set from omega to omega, which has a certain problem. So, of course, must be uh, Actually, let me mention here, I will come back to this a little bit later, uh, that, of course, here we have all these lesser inputs, and that's all we can say. Anything else here is consistent. So it's consistent that B is strictly bigger than number of 1, and so on. Also that B is strictly less than C. Uh, one thing is also that here it's consistent that B is less than C. Anything is consistent. I just mentioned B less than D because this actually holds in the most basic model for the negation of C. It holds in code. So this holds in the classical model of code who first proved the consistency of uh, the derivation of CH, I mean the independence of the continuum hypothesis, and that will be true as Okay, I want to introduce some more carbon invariants, which are very important and very basic, and they are related to the ideas of mean and null sets. And to do so, let me just say a couple of words about topology and mesh. Here. Of course, you all know the topology of the real numbers, and also mesh on the real numbers. But as I said before, uh, it's said to be preferred to work with the counter space and the pair space. They are just com combinatorially simple. I mean, I mean, one reason they are simple is, for example, when you look at closed sets, then you have uh, counter space or bare space, closed sets are just given by trees. So they are very simple. And there are a couple of other reasons. But, uh, OK, so the counter space is 2 to the omega, omega to the omega is the bare space. And depending on the context, people prefer to work with the bare space or, or with the counter space. I mean, it really depends on the context which one is uh, simple to work with. And now, of course, these are representations of the real numbers, but they are not exactly the same as the real numbers. Because you, you all know that topologically they are not the same thing. I mean, the counter space, for example, is a compact space. The reals are not compact, but they are still sigma compact, and that one is even not sigma compact. So, just if, even if you look at compactness, they are very different, but they are the same module over count of a set, let's say. And count of a sets are small in the sense of sets, in the sense we are talking about in, in the sense of set theory, and so they don't matter. And for, for this reason, uh, many things which are defined, I mean, many, uh, if, you, if you define carbon bands, it doesn't really matter in this space. That means I mean, to make an example, the bare space is topologically homomorphic to the irrational numbers. So it's, it's almost the same as the real numbers, you just have to throw away the rational numbers, and that's a kind of the And in that sense, I'm saying that even though these spaces are not homeomorphic, they are still satirically almost the same. Okay, so what is the topology on 2d omega and omega 2d omega? It's a very simple thing. You give two or omega the discrete topology, and then we have a product of omega many copies of two or omega, and there you, we, we use the product topology. So that's uh, basically the typical topology, and of course, it is a very nice space, it's an open space, it's a complete matrix, it's a separate space. The base of the topology because you work with the product topology, it just means that open sets are different, are given by finitely many models. So you just have to make it open in finitely many models. And the basic open sets are just those. You have a finite sequence, sigma to the less than omega, or it can be omega to the less than omega. And then you look at all the functions which extend the sequence. So it's a little bit of 
picture is like this. We have sigma here, and then we will get all functions which are extensions. And this is a basic way of setting this topology. It's even closer than this. Uh, and now recall, of course, this is a general definition. In any topology or space, you can define over then sets. So that's not just for two omega. A set is nowhere dense if the interior of its two is empty. So it's not dense if you advance. So then you take a, a closure that still has no has empty interior. And it's mean if it's a count of a union of nowhere dense sets. And of course, we know that these sets are small. That's the bare category theorem, which also meant completely metrized in the sets of space, like the complex space also. Uh, that uh, the whole space or even any non trivial, I mean, any non empty open set cannot be so these are small sets. And M is the sigma E of the sets in the spaces. You can also look at measure on either of these spaces, you know, measure the back measure on the real number. Let me just introduce the back measure two to the omega. It can also be done on it. Two to the omega is equipped with a product measure, so what does it mean? We have two, so this is a two element set consisting of zero and one. Each one gets measured one half, zero gets measured one half, uh, one gets measured one half, and then you take the bottom measure. So it's a very simple thing. And uh, then, of course, this means that if you look at a basic Clopin set, once one set of these form, then the measure of this will be two to the minus n, where, of course, the length of the sequence sigma is exactly n. So sigma is not two to the end, then the measure will be. And n is the sigma ideal of null such in the sense of this measure. So it's a set, it's the ideal of sets which have measures. Now once we have an ideal, we can define how to get is related to this ideal. So let's assume we have an ideal over set x. I is an ideal over set x, so I is a subset of P of x, and of course it's an ideal, so it's it's closed, it's closed under subsets, and it's also closed under finite units. And, and that's it. And of course, we always assume it contains something, it contains lentils, and it does not contain lentils. That's what we always assume here. And uh, then we have the additivity of the ideal. It's the smallest family of. Uh, Uh, yeah, it's the smallest size of a subfamily of the ideal whose unit is not in the ideal. So uh, we have a collection of sets in the ideal, but if you think the unit is not in the ideal. And of course, sigma, it just means basically how close, I mean, it means how close the ideal is. So if an ideal is a sigma ideal, that exactly means that the additivity is bigger. Uh, then we have the covering number. This is the smallest size of a family subfamily of the ideal whose unit is the whole space, the whole set X. Then we have the uniformity, non I. It's the smallest size of a subset of the space of the set X, which is not in the ideal. And finally, we have the cofinality. It's the smallest size of the base of the ideal. So, what does it mean to be a base? It means that it's a subfamily of the idea such that every set in the ideal is contained in one set from the subfamily. So it's a minimal size of the F, a subfamily of the ideal, such that given any set A in the ideal, there's a B in F. So that's a cofinality. We only look at the cases I is M or N. But even in general, if the ideal is non trivial, we can already say something about the relation. For cardinals. Now, with non trivial, I mean here, I already said that, of course, the ideal will never contain the rule of set X and it will contain something. Non trivial means that it contains all the single pieces. So it's not too small. I mean, all, the, all the singles are there, and then, of course, that's all the finite sets, so it will contain all the finite sets. Uh, then we have these relations. Additivity is the smallest, cofinality is the biggest, and these two are in between. So additivity is between non between, is, is below non, is below co, and also additivity is below covering and is below cofinality. 
I mean, for example, to see the second one, if you have a, a weakness for covering, so if you have a covering uh, family, then of course it's also a weakness for additivity, simply because the whole space, the whole set X is not in the idea. So if you have a weakness here, it also weakness is this. And then also this inequality, if you have a profile of family, it must be covering, uh, simply for the reason that we assume the idea is non trivial. So all the simple is that Okay, now let's go back to M and N, the meta ideal and the null ideal, and let's look at the relations only for meta and null. The, the, next easy, the next one, which is quite easy to prove, is this one. B is below or equal than on M, and covering M is lesser than M. So recall that these are the unbounded and dominating number, and we have the meta ideal here. And so why does this hold? It's actually quite simple. If you have a function f in omega to the omega, then the set AF, which is the collection of all x which are eventually dominated by f, that's a meta set. So let us uh, let me explain this a little bit better. So we have this AF. Let's define AFN. This is the collection of all x in omega to the omega such that for all k big or equal than n, x of k is less or equal than n. Okay. So if you define this, it means that so we have this number n, and then from n we have this function of f. Here it doesn't matter what happens, but from, from n onwards, we look, we look at all functions which from this point onwards are below. Right? below. Now, this is a closed nowhere band set. I mean, it's easy to see it's closed because we just have a universal form. That's the same. So this is, uh, right here, this is closed. So why is it nowhere dense? So it's already closed, so you only have to show that it has empty interior. And uh, that's clear because if you take any open set, now recall what are the basic open sets here? They are just given by finite sequences. If you have any open set sigma, anything like sigma, and this defines the open set, then we can extend it, and of course we can extend it in such a way that we are at least in one point above f. And so we extend sigma to tau, and then you see, of course, this floating set, which is given by this tau, this has a trivial intersection. Right. Yeah. Because here we are, we are strictly above beyond n, and this violates this condition. So, so any floating set, any open set can be, has a smaller open set, which has a trivial intersection, and that shows exactly that. Okay, so this set is nowhere dense, but on the other hand, the AF is simply the union of the AFN, and these are, they are countably many, so this set here is media. Okay, so this shows what I claimed here. Now, why <coughs> is this enough to complete the proof here? For example, for the first inequality, well, if we have a non meager set, oh, so all of these sets here are meager, and so it means that if a set is bounded by some function, it's meager, so if a set is non meager, it has to be. Just for so if you have a non meager set, it is unbounded, so it's also not meager. Of course, we have to work in that in the bare space, so we look at meager and uh, and omega to the omega. And then also here, if you have a dominating family, then you can look at all these. If you have a dominating family, you look at all the AFs, and there will be a covering family. Because of course, if you have a dominating family, then it means that for every X, there is an F in your family, so that X is less than F. And that just means we are the same. So, the, uh, so that, that finishes the proof. 
Okay, now the next proof is a little bit more difficult. It's, it's the last one which I will present in this context. It's uh, Oldberger's theorem. And it's interesting because it establishes a connection between the two ideas, between the null ideal on the one hand and the big ideal on the other. So the covering number of the null ideal is below uniformity of mega, and also the other way around, covering of mega is less than uniformity. Now, why does this hold? Well, I, I will be cheating a little bit. I mean, I'm not giving the whole proof, but only. Uh, what I will not prove is this first fact. It's the fact that there is a subset. This time we will work in the, it's much easier now to work in the couple space. And so you see I'm sort of switching between the spaces. The previous broad position we worked in the bare space because we looked at omega to the omega with eventual dominating ordering. Here we look at the um, uh, cutoff space and we will see the reason. But this doesn't matter because, as I said, the spaces are almost the same. And for this reason, the null and weak ideal are almost the same. And therefore, these Kalman invariants are just different. If you look at Kalman invariant in the bare space or Kalman space like this, non M or covering N over the they are the same. But of course, this also has to be established, but it's a basic thing. Okay. So the first thing what does it say? It says that we have a that of course that also holds in the real numbers. Here the space is not important. There is a null set which is co -mega. And co -mega means it's big in the sense of category. So it's small in the sense of measure because it's null, and it's big in the sense of category because it's co -mega, which means the complement. Uh, such a set, it, this says the two ideas are orthogonal in the set. So, uh, such a set is not difficult to construct, actually. I leave this as an exercise. You can also do it in the real numbers, if you are more familiar with the real numbers, just try to construct such a set. Okay, so this, I will use this fact, and I will use this set A, which is null and co -meter. And now the second layer is that if B is not B, then A plus B must be the whole space. What is A plus B here? A plus B is the collection of all sums of elements of A and B. So this is, we take A from A and B from B and take the sum of this. And we take all the sums. Now notice, of course, here, and that's where we actually use that we are totally omega, I'm not saying omega, omega, that here we have a very nice topological proof because uh, two, we have addition modulo 2 in 2, and then we have just that 2 to the omega. So we have the addition of 2 to the omega, which is also addition of 2. So that's the addition we are talking about. Now, let me prove this. OK, so what is the task? We take an arbitrary element from 2 to the omega, and we have to show that it is in A plus B. So we have to find some element in A, some element of B, such that X is the sum of these two elements. Um, now, by assumption, what we know is that the intersection of A and B plus X is not empty. So, why does this hold? Uh, B is a non meager set. But here I don't look at B, I look at B plus X. This is just, I mean, it's defined like here. It's just the shift of B by the real number X. It's a translation. And of course, these ideas, the null ideal and the mean ideal, they are invariant in the first stage. So if you translate a null set by a real number, it's still not. If you translate a non meager set by a real number, it's still not. Okay. So this set is also non meager B plus X, and on the other hand, A is co meager and therefore the intersection must be non empty because uh, the complement of a co meager set is mean. So this, this cannot be contained in the complement. Okay, so given that this is non-empty, we can take an element from this set. So y is in A, and it's also in B plus X. But if y is in B plus X, this means we can take a z in B, such that y is the sum of z and x. Because that's the definition of B plus X. Now, once we have this, 
we have the representation of x, because now x is simply y plus n. Recall here that we have addition modulo 2, which means that subtraction addition minus n plus is the same thing. So this is why you can just, uh, I mean, you just bring the, the, the z here on the other side. So because it means x is y minus n, but minus n plus the same thing. So it's also y plus n. Okay, so this finishes this little proof. And why is this good enough? Well, look, this a plus b, this can actually also be written in this form. It's just the union of all the, sh all the shifts or all the translations of a by little. This is, I mean, this is obviously the same thing. So, so we can write it to the omega like this. And now, why does this prove? This proves the first inequality because here we may take uh, right, B is a non-media set. Let's take a non-media set of the cardinality norm M. Then we have written two to the omega as a union of non-M many sets of the form A plus B. Now we said A was a null set, and as I said before, all its translates are also null. So this is a union of one and many null sets, and it's a common family. And of course, this proof is exactly the same with the rows of uh, null and beta interchange. Okay. Uh, we have some more results here. They are more difficult to prove, so I'm not going to give the proof I just mentioned them. A divinity of mega is the mean of covering mega and B, and cofinality mega is the max of non M and D. This is the middle trust theorem. It's a bit complicated because it's with min and max. And then there's the Bartoschinski resonance stun theorem. That's the most difficult result in this area. A divinity of null is less than equal to So it means that uh, yeah, if you have a witness, if you have a family of media sets with units not media, then you can construct a family of null sets with units not null of the same size or small size. It's actually quite, quite interesting. Right? It says, in a sense, that, that null statements about the null ideal are stronger than about the mean ideal itself. Okay, now we get Chihan's diagram. And this shows the relationship between the cardinals we have introduced so far. And a, a minute's thought, uh, I think, reveals or tells us that all the lines here, I mean, all the lines here means this is the smallest card. So when we go right and we go up, we go to bigger cardinals. And all the lines here have been proved on all various lines, or have been mentioned on various lines. For example, of course, this one, this one is a trivial, this holds for every ideal, or actually this one and this one, these are the ones which hold for every ideal. This is the Bartoschinski resonance instance thing, that's a very large theorem. And then there was this middle cross result which says this one is the min of those two, so we have this connection between these three. And we proved earlier that V is below non M. And we also proved it was Rothberg's theorem that covering M is less than two. And same for the results on the right hand side. They are sort of two. Uh, because I will refer to this diagram later on, let me just let me just write it here again. Now the question is, is this diagram complete? Uh, in the sense, does this diagram show all results which are proven in ZFC, or are there more results which we have to do? Are there other CFC proven relations between the variance? And the answer is yes, it is complete. 
and it's completely required in a very strong sense actually. And that was proved that was proved many years ago. I mean all the ZFC results were sort of proved by the some results are much older like open but uh, the final results were proved in the eighties. And uh, every assignment of the following variance to omega one, aleph one and aleph two that does not contradict the diagram and the middle plus result is of the system. I should mention the middle trust result, so there is one more thing. I mentioned this before. This one is the mean of those two. So we cannot have that this is strictly smaller than both of these. And similarly, this is the maximum. But otherwise, there are no relations, and you can assign RF1 to the lower part of the diagram and RF2 to the upper part of the diagram, and as long as it doesn't contradict the diagram. And of course, there are many, many partitions like right? that. So this involves many consistency results. And, well, as it means there's a ZFC model for the given assignment, and that's proved with the forcing method. Now, I'm not sure how, how familiar are you with forcing. All of you have seen a little bit. I have, I have to just have one slide about forcing. Of course, I cannot explain forcing now, I mean, it's, it's within each uh, Many many lectures, but let me just recall. Let me just recall some basic things. So, what we do with forcing, we have a ZFC model, and we want to extend it to a bigger model. And the idea is that you want to force some state. I mean, you want to show some consistency, or you want that in this bigger model, uh, a certain statement holds, or a certain statement clears, or whatever. For example, in our context, of course, it means that you want in the bigger model that a certain relationship between the common variance. Some columns are small and some columns are And uh, the bigger model is, is gotten in the following way. We have a ZFC model. We have a partial order in M, in this model M. Uh, one base, there are some basic notions. One is density as a subset of a partial order is dense. If given any element in the partial order, there's a smaller element in the, in the set E, so in, in the dead set. And G, again, a subset of P is a filter if, first of all, it's upwards closed. So given an element in G, everything which is above uh, P is also in G. And secondly, if we have two elements in G in a filter, then there is a common refinement, which is still in the So given P and G, P and Q in G, there's an R still in G, which is below both P and Q. So that's a notion of a filter. And then we say a filter is M generic if it meets every dense set which belongs to M. So for every dense set V, which is an element of M, the intersection is not M. And let me notice that this is, in a sense, a strong notion, namely if P is non-trivial partial order and G is generic, then G cannot be M. So this G is actually used to extend the model. So every every P in P has incompatible extensions Q. Um, so these these Q and R don't have common don't have a copy of uh, that's what it means to be incompatible. So if we have this property and G is M generic, then G cannot be M. Uh, that's actually easy to see because if G was in M It's easy to, the point is that if you have G, if you look at the complement of G, then this is a dense set. And why is it dense? Because if you, are, if you look at G and you have any condition P in G, then, or if you have any condition at all, it has two incompatible extensions, not both of them can be in G, so one is in the complement. So the complement of G is, is a dense set by this condition. Now, if G is in M, then the complement is also in M, but it's a dense set, and of course, the intersection is true. So that's the contradiction. Okay, so this is quite easy. Now, so this G is then used to build a bigger model, and G, which is called a generic model of forcing extension, it's a minimal model of set of C with a property that M is contained in MG and also that G is not. Contains T as an element, and it also contains all of M. 
and it's sort of the minimum model that is structured. Of course, when you when you write it like this, you may actually ask yourself, does this exist at all? And why? why can you do that? Mm -hmm. But the point is, there is a description of Mg inside of M and to a certain in a certain sense, and that's the main point. Mg can be described to a certain extent as an M, and for this one defines P names, uh, tau in M, one defines names in M, and then one defines the inter and then given G, we have the interpretation of the names, and Mg is simply the collection of all interpretations. So Mg is the tau collection of all tau G, where tau in M is a P name, and tau of G is the interpretation of we use G to interpret this name tau. And, well, of course, one has to, I mean, there are many definitions and things to check involved here, but the point is that once you have this description, this sort of becomes easier to understand because G, of course, also has its own name. So this model will have the property, it will contain G and it will contain M because all the original elements of the of M also have their names. And so it will clearly satisfy these two properties, but also it will also clearly be a minimum model with these properties, simply for the reason that anything uh, which is of the form tau G can be constructed using M and G. It's defined, it's defined and it's defined from M and G. And therefore it's Anyway, so this is a very short introduction to forcing. Now, let me continue with some examples. Let me recall, I mean, we have this general result of Miller on Babushinsky and Tachella, which said that all the assignments here which don't contradict the diagram are consistent. Of course, I cannot give all the results because there are lots of results. I will just present the two simplest results here. One is by Cohen forcing. Of course, this is the original forcing developed by Cohen for showing the consistency of the negation of the continuum hypothesis. And if you make the component to make a continuum RF2, it's done as follows. We have the finite partial functions from omega 2 times omega 2, 2. 2 is a two element set consisting of 0 and 1, of course. And uh, a stronger condition has more information, so it's a bigger partial function. So extends q as a final partial function. And the generic extension is, is the classical model of Cohen. I said this already. And the point is that p x mu lemma is c alpha, alpha less than omega 2 for a call. Basically, each call and p index by alpha, we get a new function, generic new function from omega to 2. And the uh, forcing argument will show that all of these functions are different and that by the CCC, we also know no carbons will be preserved, they don't be collapsed. So we will have to I'll have too many new real numbers and the continuum will be RF2, say if we start with the model of CH. So if a model of CH and we have a generic filter here, then non-M will be RF1 and covering M will be equal to C will be equal to RF2. So uh, the Cohen model will split the diagram. Okay. And the proof of this is actually not difficult, but of course we need some description of Niga now here. There's actually another representation of this forcing. So this forcing is equivalent from the forcing set point of view to the complete luminary for P omega 2, not M omega 2. So this is just the bare sets of omega 2. It's like the Borel sets basically, not below the media sets. And, uh, uh, let me not go into too many details here, but uh, I mean, the Cohen real set, the, the point really is that the Cohen real avoids all the meter sets from the that's, that's the main point here. And that's the reason why it makes covering M big, and it's also the reason why non M of the other one, because you can just look at the, there actually for this one there are two distinct arguments, but one would be. We just look at the first RF1 many code years and they will be Okay, then we have random forcing out here I defined what I just mentioned. The Borel sets 
I'm not really using that because let me just recall this. P omega 2 is the bare subsets of 2 to the omega 2 times omega. So why do I call them bare sets and not porous sets? Bogal algebra is generated by the open sets. The sigma algebra is generated by the open sets. But here actually we want something smaller. We want the sigma algebra just generated by the basic open set by these finite strings. Of course, in 2 to the omega this is the same, but for uncountable carbon this is not the same. So this is the sigma of the part generated by the basic And then we have the null subsets inside this, and then we may look at the quotient algebra. It's a complete Boolean algebra, and that's called the random algebra. It's a natural algebra related to measure. And then we look at P, which is the part of the goals in this algebra, but we take away the C1, we take away the part of everything, and then we have a nice forcing And this adds new real numbers, which are called random reals. And when we have a model of CH and the generic filter for this, forcing what do we get? Non N and P will be R is 1, and current N will be C1. So this diagram will be split here. This is random. And of course now there are many other splittings I will not present them. They are more complicated. These are sort of the uh, The reason again, because the random reals form a non-null set, Alice 1, many of them form a non-null set. That's the reason here. A random real avoids all the null sets of the ground model and therefore just to make carbon large. And finally, random force is omega to force this every new way is eventually bound by that. And this will give the result. Okay. Uh, a theorem of Mila and Bartoszewski and Schellach, which I mentioned a couple of slides ago, this is proof for C equals RF2. So when we have assignment of just RF1 and RF2, if the column is in this diagram, then any such assignment is consistent, anything can be. But we may ask, what happens if we look at larger continuum, or we look at a situation where lambda bigger than kappa are arbitrary uncountable like the cardinals, and now again we want that basically this, the lower part, of course now this is different from R1, but we may make the lower part equal to kappa, and the upper part inclusion to C equal to lambda, and we may still ask whether this is so that A be an assignment of the cardinals to cover a lambda that does not direct, contradict the diagram and the middle class result. The question is, is there a model satisfying this assignment such that as I said, C is the bigger model? So this is the first question. And of course now we can ask a much more general question. Maybe instead of just having two cardinals, we may want to have more cardinals and we just assign any cardinals here in a way uh, such that we don't contradict the diagram. So for which assignments A of the columns in the diagram uh, to three or more columns are there more, are there more sets by A? Uh, about one, one always has a positive solution if non-M is less or equal than cover. For those assignments we have a positive solution. This has been known for several decades. This is old. Uh, also, in some other situations, it's known, but there are many situations where it's not known. So even this one, which is a simple question, still has many open instances. And I will come actually, I will come back to this. So I will mention, I will mention some result about this. Of course, where we are not in this situation, but this is a trivial situation. And also some new results about this, and also some open problems. But let me look at two, which of course is in a sense the better, the optimal or better scenario that we want to get. And there, in specific situations, there's a very general positive solution. So this is the result of Kulchan, Kermel, here and Shilaf, and it says that, well, for simplicity, it's a little bit more general. Let's assume speciation. Let's assume we have uncountable regular columns, cover one up to cover nine, and then we have a forcing extension 
it looks all complicated, but it just says that we can make all these houses out of clay. But of course, we have this restriction. This one is too low. So, and also here we have some more. So this one is the smallest. Kappa 1, and comes this one, kappa 2. Then these two have to be the same, because this is the mean of these two, and that one is about this. So this has to be the same, and then this one, then this one, then these two again have to be the same, for the same is that this, then this, and one. So we have in total, if we also include our left one, we have 10 different counters. And that's of course a maximum number we can get because of these results. So this is the optimal result. But of course this optimal result is just proof for one particular situation, namely where we have this particular ordering of the problems. And this is proof with a new method, restriction of partial orders to some model. And there's actually an earlier proof of this of the same theorem just by three orders called John Kerner and Scheller using Boole and Arthur powers of partial orders and compact particles. And for while there are two proofs, of course, first it was proved with this method, but the problem with this method is it used four compact problems, so it had large problem consistency strength. And of course, we want to prove this on the basis of ZFC. We don't want, we want just the consistency of ZFC, because this type, this kind of thing it does not involve <coughs> This is sort of known, but for, for a while no proof was known, and then Another proof with this other method was found, and then it's Okay, so this is very nice. And there is one more result along this line. So there's a second model. There are only two models of this kind. This is one. And the other one is they're basically interchangeable. So in the, in the model on the slide, this is kappa 1, kappa 2, kappa 3, kappa 4, and so on. And the interchangeable would be kappa 1. Kappa 2 for these two, kappa 3 and kappa 4, and so on. So this is the difference, but there are only these two models. And the point is that both models satisfy that non and is less than recovery M, and uh, this is necessary for this method. So there is no way to use the same method in a situation where this inequality at the bottom fails. Okay, so the models use non-M less or equal than covering M. So what is the reason here? Uh, why can we only get models of this kind when we are in this situation on M less or equal than covering M? The point is that the technique which is used, which is a restriction of partial orders to some models, it's a modification of what's called iteration with finite support. Iteration with finite support is a very old technique. It goes back to the 60s, I think, to Solovey and Tenenbaum, when they first proved the uh, consistency of systems and hypothesis. So that's more of more the consistency of non So uh, that's a very standard method, but the point is that this method, iteration with finite support, only scores the same. That has been known. And uh, also, I mentioned on the previous slide there's another method which is the one with ultra, with full and ultra powers of partial orders using the compact cardinal. But this is also a modification of the duration of finance. So this method also can only give models that this is So the point is that iteration of this. Iteration with finite support introduces naturally many cone reals and therefore it forces that this one's Because the cone reals, if you have cone reals, basically get cone reals in limit stages of the iteration and therefore they make current meter larger. I mean, if we have to say the cofinality of the iteration is some uncountable cardinal, then the covering has to be bigger equal than this cofinality and not has to be less than. Because the final set of cone meters will be a non linear set. And on the other hand, if you have a uh, family of meter sets which is strictly below the co cofinality, then you still have a cone meter above. And so this is not going to, this, this problem is not going to, I mean, this is simply for all 
iteration is finite. So let's do play. When we look at models, I mean, in the theorem of Miller and Bartoszynski and Schiller, where they split the diagram in another way, I mean, there are many, there are many, many splittings, but this one is actually smaller than that one. You can figure this out. Now, what, what is used there? In most cases, iterations with confidence are used. And then there are some models which use the random algebra. For example, this one. This is not count as a sort of this is like an algebra. And also, doing it like this or doing it like this can be like Now, the first technique, uh, which is of course the one which is mostly used, and which is the most powerful iteration of confidence of law, this only works when the continuum is out. We cannot make the continuum larger than RF to this confidence of law liberation because when we continue doing it after it goes to RF1, many steps we will collapse RF2, and so we are sort of dead. So that's a big problem. Uh, now for the second, the second one can, in a sense, it can be more optimistic to use this for doing something, and that's actually true. We can do this, but of course there are not so many models. But still, there are some. I will say this. So for the second, there's a way to completely embed a random algebra when you large of all things such as there are few coordinates. Of course, if we just do the random model and there are no coordinates at all, but this will also mean that here we stay in model. That's not what we want. We want to make this bigger, but still strictly smaller than what is above. This is the real problem. And there is some solution, and that's my last slide. If we have uncountable regular cardinals, kappa less than lambda, uh, so this is something. This is something I had been actually, I've been working on a long time, but I finally finished the proof, and the, the preprint is also available on the uh, Suppose we have kappa less than lambda uncountable regular cardinals, they are arbitrary. Then there is a forcing which makes these cardinals here. So they will be kappa, they are the smaller ones. This one will go to kappa and those two. And so we have a nice splitting here where this one is to be less. And basically, what is the proof? Well, I call this shadow of iteration. Uh, and in particular, non m strictly bigger than covering m strictly bigger than r. Uh, the, I call it shadow iteration for the following reason. I look at it like this. We first force with a big random algebra. This is sort of the basic step. And then we embed more and more things into this random algebra to get a bigger order. So it's some, some iteration in this sense. And of course, we have to add cone wheels because we have to make this thing in the one. But the cone wheels are only cone over a small part of the randoms, while most of the randoms still remain random. And this involves, this involves a lot of techniques. I mean, this is highly not trivial, but uh, it can be done. Uh, and I call this shadow liberation because basically when you just start with the random, the many randoms, it's a very homogeneous, a very nice force, but then it's not to kill or shatter this homogeneity by introducing so that's why it was. You see, in a sense, this is a bit dual to finite support iteration because there is a way to a different way to look at finite support iteration. You can think of finite support iteration as first adding, you always have many code wheels. You can think of it as first adding all the code wheels, which would mean forcing the big cone algebra and then doing the rest. Because the big cone algebra embeds into the finite support iteration. So you can look at it as a two-step iteration like this. In that sense, it's dual to finite. Uh, so let me finish with an open problem. Uh, I do not know, for example, this one. Can we make this one be strictly bigger than covering M and covering M strictly bigger than R? It looks like a simple problem because this, I mean, it's known that, because it's known that it's consistent that this is bigger than this one, but in all models where this is bigger than this, covering bigger is R so that's, that's fine. Okay. I think I'm just, uh, yeah, more or less in high. Mm -hmm.